Today, my dad and I are here at Chickamauga Battlefield in North Georgia, and we're here to attend a ranger guided program to learn all about Reconstruction after the Civil War. That's coming up next. Uh, this part of the field, uh, we've come here to this point uh, because of what's on this hill behind us. That is the South Carolina State Monument back there. Now, of all the monuments on the battlefield, that, that one is kind of my, one of my favorites because I like the story about it. Because the monument you see up there today is not the monument that was originally put up here. Originally, the top of that monument was a giant palmet, bronze palmetto tree. <laughs> okay, folks, let me ask you. You have that hilltop there, and you put a bright, giant bronze palmetto tree up on top of a stone pedestal. What does it become? Lightning rod. A lightning rod, and I think that's very appropriate for <laughs> South Carolina. Uh, you study their history before the Civil War, during the Civil War, and the years after the Civil War. It's that's fitting. Uh, so what happened? Was it, it did become a lightning rod. It received so many lightning strikes that after about a year of existence. It was pitiful. It was the stump of a pine metal tree. All the fronds had literally been blown off the monument by the repeated lightning strikes. So we've got photographic evidence. We've got the monument of the day it was dedicated, the monument within a few months, a few months later, and then within a year, the rods that are sticking up with all the fronds blown off of it. So they finally gave up, took it off, and put up the, the stone obelisk on top of it that's up there today. But with that said, at least to say what we're going to talk about now is South Carolina uh, in Reconstruction. Now, South Carolina is kind of a unique story. And we're going to look at it from the story of one man who was here on the battlefield of Chickamauga, uh, was not actually fighting on this part of the field, but he was largely responsible with, for the monument that was put up here. Although he wasn't very keen on it, he called it an aberration when it was first put up. Uh, but that man is this man here, Captain and later Colonel C. Irvin Walker. C.I. here was a graduate of the Citadel. He was going to be the valedictorian of the class of 1861. Problem was the day he was supposed to graduate was April 12th, 1861. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't get his diploma until over a decade at later. Uh, Walker, uh, is a guy I know quite well because about 10 years ago I edited and published his letters from mm -hmm. his wartime letters. C.I. Walker was a very unique young man in that he is, was very artistic. Uh, the family still has furniture that he carved, has watercolors that he painted. So throughout his military career, I remember one painting is this beautiful thing of all these flowers and you see the corner of the tent in it. He actually made the painting when he was in service. But he also had a way with his letters. His letters he writes visually. He describes things. But I, I came across one thing, I came across Walker's letters as I worked with him. I really don't think I ever would have liked him. If I had known him. He's very opinionated. He's very self-righteous. Uh, and he's South Carolinian. He's from Charleston. <laughs> he doesn't like Chattanooga. And he makes it pretty painfully obvious. He called Chattanooga the last place on the face of the earth any human being should ever have to stay other than Corinth, Mississippi. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but he's very opinion. And then he, he's just, he, he's kind of a guy that just kind of stirs the pot. He loves Braxton Bragg. He hates, he doesn't particularly care for Joe Johnston, you know, which flip flops. Most Civil War soldiers tend to not like Bragg and they love Joe Johnston, but he doesn't. So, He's just one of those guys. And he is the guy that that letter that I first started off this program with, that the war was going to continue on. That was one of his letters. And so he comes home. And for a few years, he tries to go to work for his, work in his father's business. You know, he'd been trained to be a military guy, you know, civil. Well, that ain't happening now. So he go, gets married, 
uh, lady who wrote all those letters, I published the letters, he is writing all to her throughout the war. And he goes into his father's business. His father was a publisher. Uh, in fact, you all know probably their most famous work. There's a little broadside that any time you see a documentary about the Civil War, any general history of the Civil War, you see this big broad broadside that was published that says the Union is dissolved. That was printed by his father's printing house in Charleston. Uh, Evans and Co Walker Evans and Coxwell. Uh, Walker's father had been a had, had been uh, ambassador during the Civil War and all, but now he comes back home to this world. And for a few years, he works his father's state. South Carolina is unlike other states. South Carolina was a state that had a tremendous population of slaves when the war began. And they're, fa you know, they're facing heavy losses because they, large South Carolina's plantations weren't cotton plantations. They were rice plantations. Now, I hate to give comparisons to how bad things are, it's kind of like being a Civil War prison camp. People always talk about, well, being this prison is worse than being this. No, being a Civil War prisoner was terrible. Being a slave is worse than anybody could ever imagine. So being a slave on a pot plantation, being a slave on a tobacco plantation, or being a slave on a, pot, a, on a rice plantation are all bad. But I have to say, for what little I have learned and done, rice plantations had to have been hell all because you're dealing with the climate where it's extremely humid, you're dealing with brutal conditions. You're talking about cases, though, where the uh, plantation owners who own these plantations would not live there during the summer times. They all moved to the Sea Islands, or they would move up to the, the mountains over here. Uh, High Hampton, North Carolina, there's a Hamptons on the South Carolina plantation. So, you, that's playing into things, you know. This is, and so when it comes to after the war, these newly freed slaves, guess what they don't want to do? Stay in South Carolina. Well, they don't want to work on a rice plantation. If they stay in South Carolina, they don't want to work on a rice plantation because it's pure, brat breaking work with very little return. So that's going to call, create a problem. For, for, for years, South Carolina is while the stuff start pops up in Tennessee and other places almost immediately after the war, it's going to drag out in South Carolina. But Walker, it, it's be about 1869, South Carolina finally starts resisting things. And the funny thing is, although the Klan will make an appearance in South Carolina, it just doesn't quite take in South Carolina. And I always jokingly said the reason was they weren't going to hide behind a mask. <laughs> Their racism was out there in full, in full, in full view. So Walker is also a unique guy. One of the things that came, I did enjoy about his letters and what he was writing is he's brutally honest. He doesn't make, you know, he flats out says, I was fighting for slavery. I, you know, we, all my fellow people, that's what we're fighting for. He says that in his letters. But he also wrote a lot. Again, he's connected with a publishing house. He works for his father's publisher. As the war time goes on, he eventually runs the publishing company. Oh, so he starts printing books, yes. How representative of the South, the Confederacy as a whole, do you think that sentiment that he's writing about? For his group, it is. Uh, but how much, I'm, I'm talking the blanket Confederacy. How, well, how much would you attribute that writing and his sentiments to? About slavery? Uh, to a smaller percent, but the Confederate Army is made up of three block groups of men. The very first ones to enlist, like him, who are true believers. They're ideologically, politically motivated. They'll be the 10th South Carolina, the 9th, 8th, 7th, 6th, all the way down. The first 10 regiments raised by the state. Same thing, 1st Tennessee, 2nd Georgia, all these low-numbered units, all those guys that joined up either before Fort Sumter was fired upon or immediately <clears> after. <throat> By late summer of 1861, you're running out of these guys, and you have to then bring in other people. So the Confederate government's going to appeal for protection of home and protection of family. But now I will point out, one of the things that they are protecting their family and their property against is free, free slaves. They're worried about one well, of the biggest things that scared everybody to death. D.H. Hill was one of them. He actually wrote about this. 
was that he complained to a northern friend. He says, you people have no right to criticize us about slavery. He says, because you don't have to live in fear that every night when you go to bed that your servant is going to come in and cut your throat. But then again, the thing is, if you don't have to serve a you don't have to worry about your throat. But anyway, that's how they, you know, one of the fears that they're protecting their homes from is a world with free slaves. But they also are going in to protect their homes from invading Union soldiers. That's going to be a challenge. By 1862, they have to start drafting. Yeah. And ultimately, a little over 900,000 men served in the Confederate Army, 250,000 of them were drafted. And those guys come out of the mountains around here. They don't own slaves, they don't like slavery, they don't want slave owners, eh, but they're no force <coughs> in the matter. They have to go. So that's kind of the three things. Walker is that first group. He's a true believer. So there are men who like them. He is he's solidly upper middle class. Irony of all this, he doesn't own slaves. His family doesn't own slaves. But he knows his bread and butter is the people around him who are slaves. And he's always aspiring to try to get into their society. So therefore, when the state's starting to resist Reconstruction with Grant's Act, you know, the Klan is banned. They're banned from having the state militias. So how do you combat this threat? You form a club. And he will write a history of his club later on, the Carolina Rock. He said, and he notes in here, and this is where the brutal honesty comes from, the sudden emancipation of four million of African slaves wholly incapable of freedom, who naturally were intoxicated with the newfound liberty, so-called, almost invariably by them interpreted to mean the liberty not to work anymore. Again, who wants to go work on a rice plantation? and to roam in the uncontrolled idleness and vice. The whole population in the south in the rural districts, sparsely settled, had their isolated homes and families surrounded with these emancipated Negroes, unrestrained by education or intelligence, making them incapable in a, of appreciating civilization and the duties of law and order. The irony here is one of the very first things that's targeted by these groups and the Ku Klux Klan were schools. They did not want schools. They wanted them driven out, and yet they then turn around and criticize African Americans for being uneducated. But they were the ones preventing them from becoming. I thought it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, instructed by their emancipators in but one lesson, namely their right to claim an absolute equality with their former masters and owners. Of course, that's the crawl right there, that equality. They don't like that. With this danger and terror, the whites of the South were by the legislation and government of their conquerors suddenly confronted in 1866. He then goes on and says, During this period of Negro rule, the white men, of course, were determined to protect their women and children from danger and insult and their property from incendiarism. Let me burn any down. How to organize to secure the, was the question. We had tried a modified form of the famous Ku Klux Klan, which proved to be too cumbersome and liable to be abused. In other words, they don't like the hooded sheets thing. Uh, we tried ward organizations which proved to be ropes of sand too weak for serious emergencies. Neither of these answered and others had to be found to meet the crisis of threatened bloodshed and riot. Some form of efficient organization for white men was, was imperatively demanded. There existed before the war in several southern cities German rifle clubs. So purely peaceful that the United States government offered no opposition to their reforming after the war. They found a loophole. Their social features kept them alive. On the model of such rifle clubs, the Carolina Rifle Club was formed July 30, 1869. By its written constitution, it was a purely social organization. But as the weapon which was adopted was not a sporting or target rifle, 
but the 16-shooter Winchester repeater. It is not hard to appreciate that its hidden defensive object was not so peaceable as its constitution professed. The plan was imminently successful. So successful that they also form other clubs, saber clubs, where men would ride on horseback and practice with their sabers. And then they also started artillery clubs, which old town cannons would be rolled out and fired for festive occasions. What have they just done? Militia. That well, they've reconstituted yeah. an army. They've got yeah. the infantry, the cavalry, and the artillery. They brought it back. These groups will become known as an organization in South Carolina's history called the Red Shirts. They will adopt and wear a red wool overshirt. No other marking, no other thing on them, but these red. And so, with that uniform, they will actually, on election days, have social parades. <laughs> parading through town, and with the Carolina Rifle Club in particular, on June 28th, 1876, and celebrating the centennial of the Battle of Fort Moultrie, there was an equally patriotic effort aimed to secure an equally important and decisive battle for white man's rights. General Wade Hampton had been nominated for governor and it was of vast importance to make a very powerful demonstration of the strength of the white civilization of our state. They will parade through the streets of Charleston over 400 men uniformed in red shirts carrying Winchester repeating rifles carrying the flag of the 10th South Carolina which was owned by Walker. Kind of makes a statement there, a Confederate flag being carried by all of these armed sold men through the streets of Charleston. And there was a vote for, for you know, it was a preliminary vote for who was going to be the nominee for governor. And yes, who got the nomination? For Arthur Hampton, they would say. The white race is the best and most ver virile yet created. The Negro race the lowest and weakest. The whites possess courage, intelligence, and equipment sufficient to more than overbalance the immense superiority in numbers of the Negro hordes who infest in our city. And in overwhelming numbers, the country within 100 miles of Charleston. So this display of this Several hundred armed, Winchester armed men is going to tip the balance for the nomination. And it's going to tip the balance ultimately come time for the election. At the November election, the club did its full duty around the polls. Notice that, around the polls, in preventing any disorders. This duty has been performed at all elections since its formation. It was not the pleasantest, and it wasn't the most amusing to see the many shifts the men resorted to while away, to while away the tedious hours. Among those who at the call of the high patriotic duty responded with the Carolinas was a reverend and dignified college professor of advanced years. With his pistol buckled in his side, he spent today sitting on the edge of the sidewalk or some doorstep deeply immersed in a Latin class. But still, what were they doing? They were intimidating everybody that showed up to vote. And they, by the November election, they also were intimidating a little more, a little more free-handedly. There were, of course, uh, men in the state who were not too keen on all this. White men who had basically some of the poor poor who just basically were starting to see that they had a lot more in common with the newly freed slaves than they did with all these guys who had been the up the ruling class. So they were starting to make some allied movements and that's one thing that they decided they had to put a stop to. And so they then began to intimidate and threaten these, you know, they would visit some of these guys and in this one case, the case of Wade Crow, one day one of these guys showed up at Wade's house 
knocked on the door, says I got a gift for him. Handed the red shirt to this guy, told him, join us or you are doomed. Basically said, you don't put this on, march with us. We're gonna come back tonight. Yes, sir. We're dealing 1866 through 1876. So all this stuff's going on. The Carol this deal in South Carolina is going to pull up in 1876 when this election, when this one comes forward, they elect Wade Hampton as governor. Wade Hampton, it, the election of him to the governorship of South Carolina ends all Republican state government since I, they're the last one to come in. The, I, the first one was Tennessee uh, with John Brown, John C. Brown, former Brigadier General who fought here in Chickamauga, is elected governor in 1870. That's the first southern state who initially they had been able to have free votes, but now it's a solid Democrat society, you know, Democrat parties dominating from now on until modern times. This is where it started. But the key thing is to 1876, that year is a presidential election. And Tilden and Rutherford B. Hayes. And basically, Rutherford B. Hayes is the Republican nominee, and they make a deal with the devil. They basically deal, the southern states said they will support Hayes and give him the presidency. In return, he pulls out all influence out of the South. All troops are gone out of the South. All these government agents are out of the South. The South will now rule itself. It will be, quote unquote, redeemed. And they agree, Reconstruction ends. And then you have the rise of Jim, Jim Crow South. Uh, segregation, all that will extend here to modern day. So these guys all played a role in all of that. Uh, they fought here in the woods at Chickamauga, and then they're going to fight at many other places for resisting Reconstruction through eight, for the decade after the war. So that's going to kind of wrap things up. If y'all have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. If not, thank y'all for coming out today. Well, thank you everyone so much for watching this video of me and my dad visiting Chickamauga Battlefield and attending this Ranger Guided program all about the Reconstruction after the Civil War. I learned about this in a college class a couple years ago, but I really enjoyed learning even more about this part of American history. If you like this sort of stuff, please be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel because it's totally free. Each and every week I post new videos of me visiting history museums and national parks and all that cool stuff. I know you wouldn't want to miss out on any of that. So thank you so much for watching. Be sure to check out my videos at youtube.com slash tnphotobug. And until next time, this is Geocaster TN Photobug signing out. I'm indeed having a blast with the past.